Good afternoon. Welcome to today's webinar, Standards in the Recreational Field. This program will explore recreational standards within the industry. The difference between the standard of care and the standard of practice will be reviewed. The definition of a standard from the standpoint of the industry will be shared with the audience. The presenter will explore playgrounds, athletics, physical education, and recreation with regard to appropriate standards. Actual cases from the presenter's experience from over 300 cases will be utilized. Lastly, the presenter will examine how to support a case without the benefit of a published industry standard. The presenter for today's program is Tom Bowler. Over the last 18 years, Tom has served as an expert witness and consultant on over 300 cases for both plaintiff and defense attorneys throughout the United States. In 1966, Tom received his Bachelor of Science degree in Physical Education from the University of Connecticut. He earned his Master's of Education from Springfield College in 1973 and received his Certificate of Advanced Graduate Studies from the University of Connecticut in 1981. Tom is credentialed by two recognized playground entities promoting playground safety. He's a certified playground safety inspector endorsed by the National Recreation and Park Association and is certified by the National Program for Playground Safety. Previously, Tom taught elementary physical, elementary physical education for 33 years in Vernon, Connecticut. His credentials include high school coaching early in his career. He has been a director of intramurals and recreation at, the, at a Division III university. And Tom was also an adjunct lecturer teaching at the undergraduate and graduate levels. We will take two question and answer breaks during today's program. If you have a question, please use the chat or Q&A feature found on the right-hand side of the screen. We encourage all attendees to submit questions. Tomorrow morning, I will send out an email with a link to the archive recording, as well as a copy of the PowerPoint presentation used during today's program. We do ask that you take time to fill out the survey that will appear on your screen after today's program is over. Now I invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy. I'm going to turn the presentation over to our distinguished guest, Mr. Tom Bowler. Tom, the presentation is all yours. Thank you, Matt. It's a pleasure certainly to be presenting for TASA this afternoon, and hopefully the attendees will uh, glean some information. Certainly uh, the standards in the recreational field, it's a wide topic. I can't obviously cover all the standards. It's just going to give a brush overview of the entire topic, and hopefully this will create more interest uh, by the attendees. Uh, we're talking about recreational standards in the industry, and certainly this is, uh, as I said, uh, wide in scope. And our presentation today will focus, as Matt has indicated, on several areas. Uh, certainly the standard of care versus the standard of practice. I want to make that distinction in a moment. Uh, the focus will also be on what is a standard specifically. Uh, standards within the industry for recreation, and it comes from you know, various uh, areas and venues talking about playgrounds this afternoon, we're going to be talking about athletics, we're going to be talking about physical education and recreation. We're talking about playgrounds, we're talking about CPSC or the Consumer Product Safety Commission. Also in conjunction with playgrounds we'll be talking about ASTM International or the American Society for Testing and Materials. We'll also be talking about athletics and we're going to be talking about the National Federation and uh, physical education, we're going to be talking about AFERD, the American Alliance for Health, Physical Education, and Recreation, and Dance. And we talk about recreation and parks and so forth. The National Recreation Park Association uh, is one of the largest organizations uh, in that field. Uh, and we're also going to talk a little bit at the end about how do you support a case if you're an attorney without the use of a published standard. Okay, let's talk about the standard of care and the standard of practice uh, just a little bit. Uh, these definitions are fairly succinct, and I found these definitions by two attorneys in a newsletter uh, a number of years ago, and even in spite of the fact it's autumn of 1997, as you see the citation at the bottom of that slide, I think these definitions uh, fit uh, the area fairly well and certainly serve the purpose of defining exactly what is the difference between the standard of care and the standard of practice within the case. Uh, the standard of care is the minimum, notice it says minimum, acceptable conduct or forms related to a given activity or relationship. 
versus the standard of practice may or may not rise to the minimum level of care required by a given activity. And we'll give you an example of this uh, in just a moment. Let me take this case of uh, the standard of practice. There's an actual lawsuit that I had uh, with horseshoes, and I was uh, serving as the defendant expert witness in this particular case. And it involved a corporate outing picnic where you would go and shoot baskets and you'd have horseshoes. You'd have your meal with your chowder and your corn and all of that uh, under a, a pavilion. And it was a, a corporate outing. And up in the upper left-hand corner of that screen, you see uh, the, uh, well, in the center, you see number six. And to the left of that uh, would be where the uh, plaintiff uh, tripped over the uh, uh, area that would encircle the shoes and keep them encased instead of rolling around. And uh, there was some beer consumed by the client. We know that from the, the testimony given and so forth. Uh, we don't know ex the exact amount. He received a compound open fracture by tripping over that barrier and trying to pick up uh, the shoe. Uh, in defending this suit, I indicated the defendant attorney that I would check out 12 sites in the state of Connecticut to see what the standard of practice was regarding horseshoes in the state of Connecticut. And it was all around the lot. I was all over the lot as far as the standard of practice goes. Uh, and I only found probably one out of 12 at most, maybe two, that really serve the purpose of the National Horseshoe Pitchers Association as far as what they would be requiring as the standard of care within the industry. And uh, certainly you'll see that in the, uh, the next slide that we're going to. Uh, this is the standard of care within the industry as defined by the National Horseshoe Pitchers Association, which is the governing body in the United States for horseshoes. And you see here, as compared to the last slide, certainly just one backstop, not three, on a side around the encircling the uh, pitching area. You'll see the stakes all pitched three inches off perpendicular, which they should be. You see the backboard is behind the stake at least three feet. You'll see the backboard itself is approximately 12 inches high, which it should be. And the box for retention of the shoes where you're pitching into the dirt uh, would be a maximum of 72 inches in length or a minimum of 43 inches. And the width of that would be 36 inches or a minimum of 31 inches. So you'll see here something that really complies with the National Horseshoe Pitchers Association. Uh, what I did in my investigation, basically, and again, supporting a case without the use of a published standard going certainly against the grain of the National Horseshoe Pitchers Association because the attorney felt uh, that I was working with and I felt that this was not to set a world's record. It was not to set a Connecticut record. We were looking for some fun going to a corporate outing and uh, certainly the defendant uh, tried to provide the, in his wisdom the best safety involving putting three uh, boards around the horseshoe pit to stop the horseshoes from rolling. So that was the intent of the uh, owner of the uh, establishment. And uh, certainly by going to 12 sites, I quickly discovered that uh, all 12 were basically different, and certainly the standard of practice within Connecticut, not the standard of care, did not conform. So I was able to argue, I think, successfully in that particular case, uh, going to deposition at least, and never went to trial, that uh, certainly in Connecticut we had uh, a variance in the standard of care and the standard of practice was all around the lot. So uh, certainly uh, the expert on the opposing side from me was an actual uh, pitcher of horseshoes. He owned his own establishment. He had an indoor venue, and uh, he was coming from the standpoint of uh, being experienced pitching in the field. I was coming from a more of an educational standpoint, risk management standpoint, and that's where my uh, uh, allegiances uh, were in that particular case. I'd like to talk about the definition of a standard. What exactly is a standard when we talk about standards? Uh, norms established by authority, research, custom, or general consent to be used as criteria and guides in establishing and evaluating programs, leadership, areas, facility, and plans as measures of quantity, quality, weight, extent, or value. And this comes from uh, Dr. Tom Sawyer's book. Who's the, he's the editor of this book of Facility Design and Management for Health, Fitness, Physical Activity, Recreation, and Sport Facility Development. Uh, excellent book. Uh, I chose to 
uh, cite the 2005 edition, the uh, 11th edition actually, the 12th edition that came out beyond this, but I felt that this definition, uh, I found this definition to my liking in the 11th edition. I didn't find something uh, of that nature in the 12th edition. So I think this says it all. It's a mouthful, but it says it all as far as what exactly a standard is by definition. And certainly, uh, I think this is a good one to, to use. Uh, certainly, we can say that uh, the late Dr. Betty Vandersmith, who was a recognized uh, scholar in the legal field, uh, served at various universities, uh, Michigan State, Penn State, University of Northern Iowa, University of Arkansas. Uh, she has said at one time, ignorance of such standards is no excuse for failing to comply. Uh, many times when I go out to lecture, especially at the college level, I'll ask the students, I would like to see a show of hands of how many people here uh, know of the American Society for Testing and Materials International. And very few students will raise their hands. And uh, certainly this is a large voluntary standard setting body that students, in my opinion, ought to know, especially in the area of physical education and recreation because they do set many standards within that field. And I'm not saying or suggesting that you have to know all the standards out there by heart and you have to know their numbers and be able to cite them and so forth, but I'm saying have a familiarity that at least you know that the American Society for Testing and Materials International exists out of West Conshohocken, in Pennsylvania. You don't have to know the standards, you don't have to cite the standards, but being an intelligent, educated person, you really should know where to go look for those standards. And I'm not saying that you have to know all the standards, certainly. So I think that's a great quote that uh, certainly a lot of people say, well, I didn't know existed this particular standard. Well, you have to know. If you're in physical education, you have to know where to go for uh, policy statements. If you're in recreation, you have to know to go to the National Recreation and Park Association. If you're doing a playground case, you have to know to go to the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission or ASTM, either of those two groups. Uh, so pleading ignorance is, is no really excuse in her mind or in my mind. Okay, where do those standards come from? And these are just a quick review, and all of you certainly know these things already, but I'm just doing a quick, dirty review here. Obviously, we have uh, statutes and ordinances and state laws and federal laws, certainly, that help to guide us when we're uh, working on a particular case. We also have standards that are developed by the American Alliance for Health, Physical Education and Recreation, Dance, Position Papers, and so forth uh, will, will help greatly. The American Society for Testing and Materials Internationally, I've already mentioned, as well as the NRPA. Uh, documents in the field, I've cited Sawyer's book already, authoritative textbooks within the field. And uh, position papers and rule books by the NCAA and the National Federation uh, dealing with high school sports certainly are ways that we can support a case when we can go uh, to these rule books and cite a certain setback on a field or a court. Certainly very, very helpful. And here are some uh, recreational standards that do exist. I just cited a few. Uh, obviously, the uh, size of my slide wouldn't uh, permit me to obviously list all of them. But these are just a sampling, if you will, of the American Society for Testing Materials International. Some of the standards that are out there in the field, especially within our field of recreation, we have athletic footwear, baseballs and softball kinds of uh, standards. We have uh, jockey helmets, we have pole vaulting helmets, we have skate parks, we have football helmets, uh, bow strings, eye protectors, all kinds of uh, standards are out there within the field that we should really, really be aware that they do exist so we know we can go to a particular standard to cite it in a case. I'd like to give you just a kind of a quick and dirty overview of ASTM. Uh, speaking, as I said before, with college students, they do not know the uh, organization exists. Even in speaking to some attorneys, they're not quite aware that this organization does exist, and really you should be. Um, basically, the, my short one-on-one course here, the letter designation is simply they give a letter to certain standards. Okay, It could be an F, a D, or whatever it might be. So you have a number designation that follows that usually. For example, in this particular case, I took the playground standard, which is 1487, and that never changes. It's always the public playground standard. It's labeled 1487. 
the hyphenated year comes after that. So it, if it's an 11, it means it was published in 2011. And most standards within ASTM are updated within a five-year period. Otherwise, they go out of existence. They're extinct. Uh, so you should know that. So going back prior to uh, 2011, you would have a standard prior to that one that was uh, published, and they go all the way back to 1993. And some are not always on a five-year cycle, but they have to be updated within a five-year period. So you should be aware of that. So that's the numbering system that they use. It's usually a letter, and then it's followed by a number, usually a four-digit number, and then it's followed by a hyphenated number, and that usually lists the, the year it was published in, and then obviously it's updated uh, frequently after that. Okay, we're going to start talking about playground uh, standards to begin with. Uh, and there's two sources we mentioned, and here are the actual uh, addresses for those uh, organizations. Uh, I might mention that the American Society for Testing and Materials International uh, is governed by a membership fee of $75 per year, which is a bargain. Uh, you, as a member, will get one of their volumes by choice and you can pay for other volumes as you go along it comes in uh, hard copy bound uh, books or it comes in cd-roms the various standards uh, i choose to get the hard bound copy it's easier for me to bring to a deposition a hard bound copy and, and cite that even though it's a little cumbersome than bringing a cd-rom sometimes and having a computer set up at the deposition and so forth uh, to cite those uh, the volumes that I'm interested in particularly are 15.07 and 15.11, and those would contain the ones that are in the playground sports athletic field, those two volumes. Uh, those are the two I get every year. They will come out just about this time every year. Uh, 15.07 and 15.11 uh, do come out in November, and so my November publications will indicate uh, the 2012 uh, standards for this particular year that we're in. Uh, that is fee-based, uh, usually. For any standards you buy from them, they're fee-based. They're not online. Uh, you have to uh, pay for those standards. The whole book of standards, for example, uh, 1507, uh, will go in the neighborhood of $275 for this whole book of standards, and that's just uh, one, one volume. Uh, as opposed to the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission and Playground Standards uh, this this book is can be downloaded online, uh, hard copy by writing to them. You can't secure this book. It was last printed in 2010. Prior to that, in 2008, was the copy previous to this. Before that, 1997. Prior to that, 1994 and 1991. And then the earliest volumes in 1981. There are two volumes: Volume One and Volume Two. So these are the sources that you would cite for for playground standards. And as I mentioned, uh, it would be fee-based for ASTM and not fee-based for the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission. And by the way, I don't want to mislead. The uh, volume uh, for the playground standards contains other uh, standards other than just playground standards. Word of caution, uh, certainly. Be aware of an updated text on standards and guidelines 2012, which is out uh, recently, which cites standards or guidelines of 1988 that are 24 years old. Uh, I don't want to mention or uh, certainly uh, talk about the authors. I don't want to cite the book in question, but I do want to make mention of the fact that when you're citing standards, you have to know the source, obviously, that has the most credibility within the field. And citing a fitness source, this happens to be an updated text on health and fitness that was published in 2012, and I won't mention the author's names, uh, but they do have an appendix that goes into playgrounds. But unfortunately, they cite standards or guidelines that were published in 1988 in their appendix. And certainly, the gentlemen are very astute and knowledgeable in the health and fitness field, however, unfortunately, not very astute in the playground field. So I would caution you when you're doing your discovery for a case, be very, very careful of looking into a text and saying, oh, this is a playground standard, I can use this. Certainly go to the most recognizable source in that particular field of recreation. 
ASTM, CPSC for Playgrounds, National Recreation and Park Association also does some great things for uh, uh, playground safety. In fact, they have the Certified Playground Safety Inspector course that I take uh, every three years, uh, usually. Uh, so that's something that uh, you should should know that the National Recreation Park Association, in conjunction with ASTM and CPSC, would be the three top sources in the United States to go to for uh, playground cases, per se. Now, getting into some states, as far as who accepts uh, any part of CPSC or ASTM, uh, various states will have some endorsements. More likely than not, the Consumer Product Safety Commission, in some form of endorsement, are accepted by those states that you see at the bottom of your screen in some form. For example, Connecticut, I know, I believe it was in 1999, the state legislature accepted the Consumer Product Safety Commission's guideline or uh, additions that would be updated thereof uh, for the future. Uh, as a voluntary standard, and it would be up to the uh, voluntary guideline, a voluntary standard. It would be up to the state in the future or those towns within the state of Connecticut uh, if they chose to accept it on a voluntary basis. So it was, a, it was very permissive, the legislation in Connecticut, where as opposed to California, where it's a bit more restrictive. So you have to check with the various states and see what kinds of uh, laws and what kinds of endorsements the state legislatures in your particular state would be giving uh, the endorsement of the CPSC uh, and putting that into effect of law. But you can see there are more states that don't have, obviously, any kind of laws or teeth uh, in playground safety versus those that do. Sixteen states do, and the rest of the balance do not. Okay, let's talk just a little bit about the law and, and specifically playground standards. Um, they don't have the effect of law unless it's specifically stated within the public sector. When you get into health care facilities, daycare facilities, excuse me, uh, governed by the Department of Health, usually in the various states, there you will have it specifically stated perhaps how deep the protective surfacing has to be. You'll have it designated if the playground equipment has to be anchored in the ground. So when you get into daycare equipment, uh, there is some more law in effect that takes place with playgrounds. Uh, however, with public schools and the public uh, parks, you don't have those laws that are that mandated and that specific, generally speaking, unless it's a, a total adoption of CPSC. And again, that's a voluntary guideline as opposed to a, a, a standard. Uh, ASTM is a standard, but it's voluntary in nature, whereas CPSC, uh, the standard, is a voluntary guideline. Uh, and they chose to make it a voluntary guideline when they set out the Consumer Product Safety Commission. Uh, there are no federal inspectors for playground equipment to check on the compliance, so uh, let it be known that there's not someone out there uh, from uh, uh, any department associated with the United States uh, looking at the safety of playground equipment. And there are no state inspectors, generally speaking, in states checking for uh, safety in the public sector. Uh, California, I believe it is required that they do have a certified playground safety inspector check their equipment. It would be wise that all the states in the union would have CPSIs, certified playground safety inspectors, checking their equipment to make sure it complies uh, when it's installed or even after any kind of changes are made in the standard to make sure it uh, complies with the uh, ASTM or CPSC, but certainly that is not done from my experience many times in the field, unfortunately. Let's look at some non-compliant issues that typically would be involved in a, a lawsuit, uh, uh, and certainly these would deviate from this, the standard of care within the industry. On the left-hand slide, you see uh, the typical probes that would be used in the playground industry. Uh, you see here a large round uh, probe to the left. It's a little bit out of out of skew here because of uh, crowding the photographs onto one picture of the, the slide, but believe me, it's round. It's not elliptical in nature. And that would represent a, a child's head. Uh, the 95th percentile child at, the, at five years old, that would represent the child's head. And basically from the measurement would be taken from the tip of the chin to the back of the head of nine inches. And the, that's the head probe in the industry. 
and there's a standard probe that's used within the playground industry. To the right of that, you see the torso probe, and basically that would be a child that would be uh, two years old at the five percentile uh, development room. And here you see the torso probe would fit through if a child wiggled their torso through that space at the bottom of the railing, but the head probe, unfortunately, would not fit through. All right, what does this mean? In essence, this would mean that a child would slither through, a young child, say, that's three years old, would slither through, and the head would get lodged at that point where you see my head probe to the left. The child would asphyxiate, strangulate to death. Uh, so those are probes, standard probes that are used within the industry, uh, certainly to protect against uh, death and asphyxiation. Uh, this is one non-compliant example of uh, a railing that is not set at the appropriate height, obviously, when they installed it. To the right, you'll see the blue arrow pointing to a geotextile fabric. Uh, in layman's terminology, that's a, a weed barrier, if you will. You can see a little bit of black ruffle there through the uh, wood chips. Uh, that is indicating to me, certainly, the wood chips are not sufficiently uh, deep enough. Wood chips on a playground should be placed down to 9 to 12 inches and they compress down uh, from 15 to 12 or from 12 to 9, ideally compressed down to 9 inches of wood chips. And uh, uh, you will see that uh, sometimes on playgrounds that are not maintained, that's a, certainly a telltale sign that a playground is not being maintained when it's right down to the weed barrier. It's also a trip hazard on playgrounds uh, as well. Another couple of non-compliant issues with, with playgrounds that you do get involved with and not, do not meet the standard of care within the industry. To the left, you see a quite obvious open S-hook at both ends. Uh, the standard of care within the industry would be four one-hundredths of an inch, which mean nothing to most people. But if I said to you four one-hundredths of an inch would be the thickness of a credit card or the thickness of a dime, uh, certainly that you could relate to that and have some feeling of how thick that would be. That's how far it would have to be crimped back. Uh, you would not be able to fit a credit card through the end of the S-hook on either end or a dime, pass it through. And if it was crimped that tightly, and you can't use your everyday home pliers to do that, you need a special S-hook plier to do that that's about three feet long in order to make that crimp. And once you bend the S-hook into, into position, if you were to take them down for the winter time, the swings, and take the S-hooks off the uh, hangers, uh, obviously that S-hook now has been compromised and you should not be using it and again. And you should only use manufacturers' S-hooks that are uh, obviously endorsed by them, not going out to your local true value and getting S-hooks uh, off the shelf. Uh, so that's a common problem sometimes in playgrounds that you don't have the compliance of S-hooks uh, uh, on, on swings either at this end or at the seat end. Uh, and the other issue here is a, a playground with an overhead uh, ladder, uh, circular overhead ladder, and that is uh, way too high. Trust me, I've measured it, and it's way over the uh, permissible 84 inches or 7 feet, and it was a, way up about 8 feet. So uh, certainly that is a, an issue with playgrounds. And the 84 inches would come from CPSC or ASTM, setting the standard within the industry. Uh, fencing issues are certainly uh, a problem as well. This was a death case uh, out in the Midwest I had where a child in an apartment complex uh, was playing in the playground area, as you see, to the left. And on the other side of that fence was a roadway. Uh, and the child, unfortunately, went through some slats that were missing where the orange cones are. Uh, it was a hit and run, hit and skip, as they called it in the Midwest and the child was thrown down to that telephone pole, which was 50 feet away. Uh, certainly, fencing uh, should be uh, provided in uh, uh, playgrounds that uh, are close to roads, and cer certainly uh, this was uh, not done. Uh, there is a AF ASTM standard, F2049, uh, and certainly that addresses children's outdoor play environments and barriers, appropriate barriers and fencing. So there's a whole different... Uh, standard that addresses fencing on playgrounds and certainly this should have been provided if they were doing their job appropriately and maintained they provided a stockade fence a privacy fence but it was not maintained uh, we had deposition testimony and statements from witnesses 
uh, at this apartment complex that uh, the slats had been kicked out on a, a regular basis and they were not uh, maintaining them, uh, unfortunately. And the child slipped through uh, an opening in the fence and was playing and went out into the road and was hit and they never found the driver, unfortunately. This is a Minnesota case, and I, I just rhetorically, I guess, pose the question, does the same standard of care apply? Uh, if you have some wet or slippery rungs, obviously in most climates you would say, well, this is dangerous and students shouldn't be on the equipment. But when you look at the state of Minnesota and talking to the attorney out there, it was a defendant case for me, uh, it gets cold in Minnesota very quickly in the fall and uh, certainly you could have uh, snowfalls very early in the f in the fall and you could have that winter season stretch on to spring and it could be a long season uh... the teacher was out there in the middle of january and what she thought was a sunshiny day and certainly a day that she felt she could bring her students out but unfortunately uh... the student uh... slipped and had a groin straddle injury on that rung that the arrow was pointing to uh, this was not the state of affairs the snow wasn't that uh... Uh, covered as the child fell, but there was some snow, I'm told, on the equipment uh, at that time. But uh, does the same standard of care apply? Do we universally apply it that, no, children cannot play on equipment if it's at least a bit uh, icy or cold? And talking to the attorney out there, kids in t Minnesota are tough kids, and they play on equipment when it's cold. They play when it might be, uh, you know, s snow on the ground where normally uh, – in Connecticut, for example, even though it's a northern climate type state, uh, it wouldn't be permissible to take students out and to play on equipment uh, if it was uh, at least a bit snowy. So I raise that issue, does our standard of care shift somewhat when we go to different uh, climates of the country? And can we apply universally the same standard of care uh, throughout the United States? Go back one. I think, uh, Matt, we've come to our first Q&A session. Excellent. Thank you, Tom. And to all the attendees out there, if you do have a question for Tom, please use the, uh, the Q&A or chat feature found on the right-hand side of the screen uh, to submit your questions. Um, Tom, we, we've, we've talked a lot about standards and, um, and the bodies that uh, produce the standards. And uh, we have a couple questions here about, about signage. Um, is there a standard or, or a body uh, for assigning standards um, for signage on a playground? Um, basically, CPSC would be a, a group to go to to uh, look at that. Uh, in fact, 2.2.6 uh, talks about signage and labeling. Also, ASTM uh, addresses that as well within their standard. So those two groups, again, would be uh, the groups that you'd point to, CPSC and ASTM. And in both their volumes, either of their volumes, they will address signage. And uh, certainly ASTM has been very specific over the years in revising their document, in, including uh, the hazard warning triangle. And they have to have, obviously, the playground manufacturer identified. And certainly it's advisable to have... Uh, signage that indicates the age appropriateness of the equipment, et cetera. So ASTM and CPSC would be the groups to go to, and ASTM is a little bit more definitive and exacting than CPSC is. And to follow up on that question, how important is signage on a playground for children? It's very important in my estimation, certainly by giving guidance to the uh, appropriate uh, uh, parents uh, and supervisor, caregiver. Uh, in fact, I was in New Jersey just yesterday doing two inspections on the same playground because there was two different instances that occurred there on this particular playground. I won't mention the town. And uh, uh, I saw a lot of signage. Uh, one of the uh, particular signs that's in, more in vogue right now is no smoking on children's playgrounds, no smoking within the vicinity, no dogs are permitted on playgrounds. They had a dog park there as well. Uh, uh, as far as signage for uh, ages, I did not see that, unfortunately, and there were a lot of uh, moms there with infants in strollers and so forth, and they were bringing their children onto this playground, and parts of the playground, although it was designed for 2 through 5, much of it was designed for 5 through 12, so many of the elements would not be appropriate. However, it, there was no signage there that would give the caregiver any kind of uh, information about who 
this playground was really for. Okay, we've had some questions about um, supervision on a playground. Can you talk about, and it, it's a two-part question, can you talk about how important supervision is on a playground, and are there any standards which relate to the appropriate um, student supervisor ratio on playgrounds? Supervision is extremely important on the playground. Uh, many times when we go to a public park, students will be there by themselves and uh, uh, totally unsupervised. Uh, relating again to yesterday, uh, it, was a, it was in the afternoon, it was just after lunch, I was on my second ins inspection, and uh, there were some very loud, boisterous uh, children on the playground. They were running up and down the slides and playing tag, and uh, the mom was off to the side, and she was having a cigarette and smoking, and uh, she was talking to her friend, and she was totally ignoring the children playing it. Once in a while, if the child got too much out of control, uh, they would you know, make a remark to the, to the child. But certainly in injuries on a playground, supervision has been named as the culprit uh, many, many times, or lack thereof, uh, and certainly that and maintenance. Uh, are the two main major reasons why kids get hurt on playgrounds, either lack of supervision or lack of maintenance of equipment. And uh, the second part of that question that uh, you asked, uh, Matt, in regard to uh, standards uh, that relate to ratios, you'll have uh, a couple of uh, groups uh, uh, espousing ratios. First, your daycare centers, that might be uh, stipulated by the state. For example, I know when I was uh, doing a case in Philadelphia a number of years ago, I believe the uh, ratio was 1 to 15 for a particular age group uh, uh, in the daycare. And again, that goes by you know, the ages and so forth. If there's uh, uh, the National Association of Early uh, Childhood uh, would indicate that uh, uh, various groups, if it's... Uh, Infants, perhaps a one to four ratio. If it's a toddler, then they have uh, another ratio and so forth. But uh, the National uh, Program for Playground Safety, uh, the University of Northern Iowa, would indicate basically for an elementary school class, the same ratio that you would have in the classroom and the inside of the classroom, that same ratio should be applied outside for recess. So if you have a one to 25 ratio for a classroom and a uh, teacher of third graders, you should have that same ratio outside when you're supervising for recess. So it's a two-part prong uh, uh, approach to, to uh, the standard. Certainly some are mandated by the uh, Department of Health if, if it's uh, uh, looking at uh, daycares. And then again, you have to look at the National Program for Playground Safety, and they do have uh, some suggested ratios. Again, they're not mandated for the uh, public schools. And then, of course, you look at case law, and it's all around the law on uh, ratios for playgrounds. Anywhere from 1 to 40 uh, up to 1 to 90 uh, can be uh, in, in case law if you do any research in that area. Okay, great. I don't see any other questions in the queue, so why don't we continue on with the presentation of content? Okay, we talked a little bit about playgrounds, and now we're going to get into uh, athletics a little bit. And again, just giving a broad brush uh, this afternoon and the hour that I've been given really doesn't provide uh, any depth, but it will give the uh, attendee some places to go uh, to look for these sources. Athletic standards, if you're dealing with a high school type case, certainly what we call commonly called the National Federation, and uh, we don't go into the the rest of it, but it's the National Federation of State High School Associations. And uh, certainly they have an excellent book, just published the newest guide out in uh, 2012. The editor is Jay Gillis, and uh, it's a field and diagram book. And uh, certainly uh, that should be very, very helpful if you have a case dealing with high school athletics because your baseball fields, your football fields, soccer fields, uh, are, are related in that case. It gives all kinds of dimension. It's updated every couple of years, and I try to get the latest edition. So it's an excellent source to go to is your National Federation of uh, State High School Associations. Uh, of course, your NCAA as well uh, for the uh, collegiate level. The athletic standards and on facilities, uh, I, I don't think there's any better book on the market than uh, Tom Sawyer's book. Who, he's the editor. And... Uh, uh, a fantastic book. He's been uh, doing this for a number of years. I know him personally. 
Uh, he's the editor of this book. He uh, selected the best minds in the country to write the chapters in this book. Uh, and it's a fantastic book for courts, for fields, for anything under the sun is relating to health and physical activity and recreation and sport. So this is the the book that I would go to in a case if I had to cite uh, a particular uh, facility uh, matter. Uh, standards, I should probably put a big question mark out. This is not the standard for backstops. This is not what put a big question mark after that word backstop because this is uh, certainly not the standard that we're, we're, we're looking at uh, or seeking. Certainly here I have a, a case. It was uh, uh, going to be a defendant case for me, and the attorney did uh, retain me to look into the matter of what it would be the standard for backstops in a softball or baseball field. This happened to be a softball injury. Uh, here you have a, a rigid pipe, which they tried to uh, uh, pad with some uh, pipe-type insulation that they put around it, some foam, and you can see it's not really holding up to the weather, which wouldn't. It would get decayed and obviously frayed, as you see in this particular slide. Uh, they did a mock-up, a prototype for it, for the, I believe, for a deposition. I, I wasn't deposed in this case, but this is what they did as a mock deposition, I guess, uh, and it was a uh, sharp type of uh, metal uh, plate there that the youngster eventually got cut on. You could see a severe laceration uh, around her knee cap area where she was going as a young softball catcher in high school back to the backstop where she got lacerated on the metal back there. So certainly that was not certainly the standard of care within the industry that we would uh, uh, espouse. When we look at football fields, we look in this particular case, this is a high school field, a uh, very antiquated field. Uh, you can see that it was a multi-use field. They were using it for track with the uh, red lanes running around the outside, the green portion. They're using it for football as well. If you look onto the track about lanes uh, two and three, you'll see uh, it's also the corner kick for soccer. So they're using it for three different things, track, football and soccer, uh, obviously all at the same time, but it could be used as a multi-purpose field. Unfortunately, it was about 99 years old from what I've been told in this case, and the uh, field really and track was really too close to the concrete abutment. If you look to the left, and I apologize for this grainy slide, but it was taken off a video uh, that I had. So you have two athletes impacting that yellow pad. So they did recognize to put yellow pads in the corner because they recognized it was a hazard. In that regard, uh, they did put the padding, so I would certainly uh, applaud them for that. However, the field is too close. It was only, as I'm pointing with that red arrow uh, uh, going up, it's less than 15 feet to that obstruction. And it clearly states in the High School Federation rule book for football, you should have at least five yards of no obstructions around a football field. So uh, certainly they were not in compliance with the National Federation's rule book on football. Uh, here's you have a lack of a proper setback, really, uh, from the baselines, and you really should have 25 feet, and this was a pony kind of, little league kind of field. And the mother was really watching where the blue uh, face is there, the sad face is watching her son beyond the protective area. That's not a dugout. That was a spectator area. And a ball from another field, because this is a multi-field complex, all the home plates backed up to one another. Uh, they were all together. And usually you have uh, assumption of risk in any kind of baseball kind of case. You have the limited duty rule where the owners have to provide just a screen and area for the spectators to uh, satisfy that limited duty rule. And here you see that they did have somewhat of a screened-in area, but they could have obviously, the burden would have been slight to extend it on. And I really felt this was not really the typical limited duty rule where a person gets hit in the stands with a bat or a ball. Here was a different case scenario where a ball from another field came over and hit this woman. And I really felt that the screening from the adjacent field uh, should have been higher. And in this particular case, the setback uh, was incorrect for the uh, foul line as you go down where the American 
uh, flag is going down into right field. Uh, so this is an interesting case as far as the setback goes. It was settled out of court. I was never deposed. We never went to trial. Uh, but uh, going to the limited duty rule, I just felt that this was a, a totally different type of case uh, when you think of the limited duty rule in, in baseball. A non-traditional play areas can uh, provide some uh, some problems, I think, uh, in, in, in the whole recreation standard industry. Uh, looking at the slide on the left, that's a hallway in a high school, and typically indoors in winter climates, uh, they practice indoor running track. And uh, you can imagine what happened at the end of the hallway. Uh, one boy was racing another boy, and one boy impacted uh, the wall without any padding, the benefit of any padding at the end of the hall. Uh, here you see a typical gym. You're going to say, well, what's wrong with that? Uh, well, in spite of the fact it doesn't have a wooden floor, it had a linoleum floor, that wasn't the issue. There was no padding anywhere in the uh, gymnasium whatsoever, and they were playing a game of flag football in this particular case, which morphed into two-hand touch football, and uh, a boy was pushed into this wall on the, that you see on the far side underneath the windows, and that was the out-of-bounds line, and according to the testimony by the plaintiff. Uh, he told me that that was the area that they were using for out-of-bounds. Uh, so, in essence, there wasn't any buffer zone. There wasn't any area where they, uh, you know, would have a safe area to run out-of-bounds. So, certainly, playing football, certainly, I would not advise it indoors uh, in that situation. Uh, here you see a health fitness facility and you have uh, three things going on again you have a basketball court you have a pool to the right hand side where you see that blue arrow and you see a track uh, unfortunately the uh, lip of the uh, basketball court is uh, somewhat uh, unorthodox and it uh, slopes down this metal plate and uh, I was there inspecting and the attorney left me at this health fitness club and within about 15 minutes he comes back and I was wondering what he wanted. He said, gee, I just happen to think I got down the road. I'd like to really demonstrate what a foot would look like on this and the uh, planting of the foot on the on the plate, uh, of the unorthodox plate of what exactly happened to my client. Uh, it was a plaintiff case. So uh, very unorthodox. Usually you would have uh, basketball courts flush with the floor. Sometimes they're placed on top of. This happened to be, I believe, a tennis facility that they wanted to change into uh, a basketball court and some other things, and uh, they placed it on top, but it's very unorthodox to have this kind of arrangement. Uh, physical education protrusions from bleachers sometimes happen with the handrails, and this can protrude into the space, and uh, certainly uh, this can be injurious if they do. That uh, ever so slight, you can't see it from that angle, but it was protruding into the space slightly in the youngster ran into it uh, playing a game in physical education. The appropriate, appropriate, lack of appropriate buffer zones, the lack thereof, uh, can result in an injury. In this case, uh, the setback was uh, only uh, 2 feet 10 inches, as you see in this slide, and the girl was playing a chase and flee type of game that we call it, and she ran into a wall that was only 2 feet 10 inches off the, off the end line thereabouts. Uh, and received uh, uh, a serious injury. Uh, so the setbacks should be you know, appropriate uh, for the games, and we shouldn't have children running toward walls that are unpadded. Here you see the typical buffer zone, or lack thereof, in older, older facilities. You can see in the black the actual measurements, and in the white uh, on top of the blue arrows what it should have been. You'll see the basket backboard uh, and the net up there, and I'm bringing that arrow on down vertically, and from that point, it should be four inches to your end line. And from the end line, ideally, it should be three to 10, and obviously the recommended 10 would be uh, certainly more sufficient than three. But in older facilities, sometimes this does not occur. And notice the padding, it's only at the lane. It doesn't extend beyond the whole wall, and certainly playing basketball, you can get hurt going into the concrete block wall, uh, not just at the lane area. Running toward a, a wall, uh, this was a preschool gymnasium uh, case at a daycare, and certainly running toward a wall, again, this was unpadded. Uh, the child was going from left to right, 
and was supposed to do a U-turn and come back at uh, the arrow on the top there and go on the trampoline. Unfortunately, she tripped on the wedge mat and then flew into the wall, and there was a supervision issue also because I believe the two uh, caregivers were back a ways and talking to one another. Lack of a standard. Uh, this is a gas mirror, and you're going to say, what does this have to do with standards and physical education, athletics, and playgrounds? Well, I had a call from an attorney in Alaska, and he was asking me if I could take on this case involving a gas meter. And I'm questioning him. I'm asking him, do you sure you have the right, correct expert? And these bollards were, pipe bollards were protecting this gas meter in this very low socioeconomic trailer park in Alaska. And this was their form of play. They I was playing on this, these pipes as his jungle gym. It was his little playground. And uh, unfortunately, the pipes were not anchored and topped over on the child, toppled over on the child, and the child received uh, uh, internal uh, injuries, severe internal injuries, uh, had to be operated on. And uh, the question becomes now, you know, what was the standard in the gas industry, I guess, as far as securing your bollards in place? And certainly uh, this was not... Uh, something uh, that was done and it was a little unusual case for me and the attorney said well I, when I asked him I said do you want me to be your expert yeah, I'm sure you, I don't know if you have the right expert he said no I want you because you know about play you know about how kids uh, move and so forth and I, I want someone who, who knows about uh, play so that's why I, I was retained on the case uh, but you see here from an actual notice that they had on a previous uh, gas guard this one happened to be attached to a wall I guess a sort of bolted to a wall but you can see the uh, very, very crude sketch by the uh, meter person that was going out there and checking. They had this problem before. Um, and uh, you could see the meter guard, the lower left-hand corner, the meter guard stand not drilled in ground. Uh, so this was something that they had actual notice served on them previously, and it wasn't something that uh, was just a one-time occurrence. Uh, this is an, a case I had... Uh, in the last year, actually, a slide case, if you will. You could see the outside physical uh, dimensions of the slide, 22 feet high from the ground to the, the point where you would go down. It's a covered slide outdoors uh, made of hardwood, not the traditional plastics or metals that we have within the industry. And the CPSC or the ASTM standards would not seem to apply in this particular case. And you could see how you would get up to the top of this slide. It ran about 75 feet long, I believe. Uh, to the top of it, you would have to go up a staircase made out of cleats all the way to the top, and then you would slide down on burlap sacks. This is akin to many of the slides that they have at big, giant state fairs and so forth. Uh, however, the ASTM standard, the CPS standard, wouldn't seem to apply. And when I took on this case as the plaintiff's expert witness, uh, I did some research and found at East Fairmont Park uh, at the Smith Playground in Philadelphia, PA, they have probably only the other wooden slide that looks anywhere like this one. Probably not quite so long, probably not quite so high but that's the only one in the United States. And looking at the maintenance of this particular slide that you're looking at, this was not maintained, unfortunately. A boy halfway down had a splinter that was described as 18 inches long and about a quarter of an inch to even wider, uh, hitting him in the groin abdomen area, and he had to be airlifted to uh, John Hopkins in Baltimore to get it out. They actually took 45 minutes to get the boy dislodged because he was stuck there for 45 minutes on the slide, took him to John Hopkins to get him off, uh, once he was off this, to get medical treatment. Uh, the East Fairmount Park one in Philadelphia was maintained one time per week after checking with them, so I used that in my deposition as a fact. This one was a haphazard maintenance type of schedule. Uh, so when you're going to lack of a standard, you can't cite a standard, sometimes it's wise to see what is the standard of practice within the industry, do some research, look into what other people are doing with slides and so forth in this particular case. We're almost to the end, and I'd like to just summarize so we have some Q's and A at the end here. I think you have to know your various recreational organizations when you look for a standard. Uh, 
uh, don't rely on the health and fitness book that I was speaking about previously that was a 2012 edition, and they're citing a 1988 standard. You have to research the appropriate standards for your case. Cite the standard which was current with the, at the uh, date of the incident, DOI. Uh, if it was a question of the case occurred on March 8, 2011, obviously you're not going to cite a 2012 standard. You have to cite something that was uh, current at the time. Uh, you may need a historical standard, something that goes way back in years to, to really look at uh, what uh, was happening at that point in time. Interview and compare your experts. Uh, if you're looking at uh, hiring someone, do they really know the standards within the field? Are you hiring a physical engineer really for a playground case where you'd be more advised to hire a playground person that has a certified playground safety inspector's uh, certification? Uh, Retain the expert with the best credentials. Uh, you know, we hire plumbers and home improvement people at our house, and we maybe survey three or four of them before we choose the right one with the right price. Do we do the same with experts if you're an attorney, or we just pick up the phone and say, well, this guy sounds good. I, I don't know anything about him, but he sounds good, or this lady sounds good. Uh, have the investigator or your expert take several photographs. I usually go out and take maybe 100 at each site area. Uh, and have that person take several measurements. It require the photographs, if you're an attorney, if you're one of the attendees, if you're an attorney, to come back to you in a CD-ROM form directly after the site inspection. And obviously, it goes without saying, if you have several standards, any kinds of ordinances, laws, any kinds of uh, uh, position statements, any kinds of uh, standards, that will, guidelines that will make your case stronger, you'd be wise to cite several of them. Uh, before we get into Q and A, I just like to thank Matt Hyde for for certainly assisting me in this project and uh, Tassa for allowing me to present uh, this webinar. I think this is about my fourth webinar for Tassa, and it's always a pleasure to present for them. And I think Matt, we're going to Q and A's if we have any time. Excellent. Yeah, we have a little bit of time here, and uh, I'd like to get to a couple of questions. Uh, Tom, I believe in the first section of the program uh, you talked about pr protective surfacing on playgrounds. Um, will protective surfacing on playgrounds insulate children from most fractures if the material meets the quote-unquote standard of care? It will and it won't. That's kind of a, a trick question because uh, certainly uh, it can be up to the specified uh, amount uh, of nine inches compressed, You, generally speaking. That's what the industry would uh, want you to have if it's wood chips. But sometimes it's just the way the child falls. It will not protect against all injuries. The ground cover, protective surfacing cover, basically the head is the benchmark for the industry and it should absorb uh, something of 200 G's or less. If it's beyond 200 G's of force or less, a serious head injury may occur. So we don't have a standard that will protect against long bone injuries, the humerus, the radius, the ulna, and so forth, uh, tibia, fibula. So we don't have a, a benchmark that would protect against that, unfortunately. But more likely than not, more likely than not, if there's more ground cover there, uh, more likely than not, it would hopefully reduce the seriousness of that injury. It won't maybe prevent that injury from occurring, but the seriousness of it, it may uh, uh, certainly uh, protect against. And Tom, you've been, you've been doing this for, for quite a number of years. Um, are you seeing any emerging trends or any new um, issues popping up um, in cases that you're working on? I, th I think the two or three emerging trends would be that uh, we have a lot of fractures uh, resulting from horizontal ladders. I was just on the phone today with an attorney in southern New Jersey, and he's talking about a fracture case uh, with me um, from a horizontal ladder, and that seems to be a prevalent theme. A lot of horizontal young children, five, six years old, don't have the strength to hold on, get out to the first rung, maybe the second rung, and just drop because they simply don't have the strength. We have a lot of non-compliant children getting involved in lawsuits. I see that as a trend with injuries and in lawsuits, uh, children that are not following directions, not paying attention in class, uh, getting, getting hurt on playgrounds or getting hurt in athletic uh, venues, physical education venues. And the ever-evolving standards in ASTM, it's constantly changing, constantly in flux. They're always meeting uh, either on the home 
uh, equipment standard or on the soft contained standard. That's the type you see in Burger King's, McDonald's, and uh, Chuck E. Cheese, places like that, um, and, and the home uh, home and uh, uh, standard and, and the public standard as well. They're constantly uh, upgrading that as AS10 evolves with their standards. So that's constantly in the mix and constantly evolving. So those are some of the things I see uh, that are uh, the trend, the trending in the field. Okay, great. I don't see any other questions in the queue, and it is three o'clock. Oh, we just have a. Um, uh, yeah, I don't see any other questions in the uh, in the queue. Um, do you have any concluding remarks that you'd like to make? I just want to thank AA's Tim for for certainly uh, helping me with this project, and certainly it's been a pleasure always to. Uh, uh, present for uh, 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 TASA, rather, and uh, certainly uh, uh, it's been a pleasure working with you, Matt, and uh, it's been a pleasure presenting for your attendees, and I hope they found it beneficial and uh, get something out of the presentation. Again, it was a quick and dirty overview, but hopefully they got something from it. Okay, excellent. And uh, just very brief briefly to wrap up here, um, if you'd like to speak to Tom about a particular matter that you're working on, you can contact us here at TASA. Our telephone number is 800 523 2319. As I mentioned during the introduction, I will send out a link to the archive recording of this program tomorrow morning. In that email will be a copy of the PowerPoint presentation that was used during today's program. The archive recording of this program, as well as all of our previous programs, can be found in the TASA Knowledge Center. If you visit our website, tassanet.com, click on the Knowledge Center tab found on the, up, on the, uh, on the top of the screen, you'll be able to uh, uh, to access all of our previous programs. Our next webinar for legal professionals, Survey Research Methods, Collecting and Processing Data, uh, will take place on November 20th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. If you have any follow-up questions or comments, please send me an email. Let me know. Uh, we do take all of your consider comments under consideration, and they help us uh, to produce better programs. And, and just one final thing, you'll have a survey appear on your screen after you leave today's program. If you could take a couple of minutes and fill that out, that will help us um, as we move forward with programs. Uh, thank you so much for, for your time today, and we look forward to seeing you at uh, future events.